Here. Chairperson Burgess, we have a quorum. Thank you very much. Moving on to approval of minutes. Number one, DDA board regular minute, meeting minutes, September 13th, 2022, page three. Madam Chair, move approval of the minutes. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. Uh, moving on to item number four, call to the public. I believe uh, Reva. Welcome. Thank you. Um, so I just had a question about uh, tonight's packet on page 66 and 67, and maybe you'll cover this um, later on with the lamppost retrofit uh, approval. Um, why are we getting new lights for downtown? That would just be my concern. It seems like the ones that we have now are just fine. Um, the ones that you're recommending are $10,000 more and increase our utilities. So I guess I just maybe, is there gonna be a presentation or anything on that? Or have you already covered those things in previous meetings? I guess that's my only question. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, moving on to item number five, consent agenda. All items on the consent agenda are approved by one vote. Number one, director's report, page 15. Number two, committee minutes and work plan and event updates, page 29. And number three, financial reports, page 46. Madam Chair, move to approve consent agenda. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries, thank you. Moving on to item number six, approval of agenda. By order of the president, chair, no matters will be discussed after 10.30 p.m. unless council board commission votes to continue the meeting. Move to approve agenda. Support. Support. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries, thank you. Moving on to item number seven, financial matters. Bill approval, page 54, and this will require a roll call. I'd like to move approval of disbursements in the amount of $58,409.86 for October. Second. Roll call, Susan, please. Burgess. Yes. Campbell. Yes. Lorand? Yes. Medina? Yes. Shell? Yes. Van Portweek? Yes. Barnett? Yes. Motion carries 7 0. Thank you. Moving on to item number eight new and old business, number one, property design phase presentation and feedback, page 58. Welcome. Good evening, DDA board. Uh, I'm Scott Reynolds with Auger Klein Aller Architects. Joined with you here tonight, Laura Pahalik is the creative director at our company. A uh, little background, we've uh, been in business for almost 30 years now and 25 of those years we're in the downtown of Lake Orion. Uh, we've been recently uh, contracted by the DDA board uh, to take a look at the lumberyard parcel. Um, so I'm going to go over uh, essentially a general update of where we're at right now, uh, taking a look at the opportunities of that site. So a little overview of uh, the DDA exploring the opportunities of the Lumberyard site. Uh, one was to create a gateway into the downtown um, to explore additional parking. That would be uh, an opportunity of developing this parcel into something, um, exploring and strengthening the trailway connection to the Paint Creek. Uh, which was the, the first um, rails to trail project in Michigan and obviously connects to the larger uh, Iron Bell Trail project uh, throughout the state of Michigan. And then also to look at um, the economic investment opportunity that might be created by uh, developing the Lumberyard parcel. Um, <clears throat> a little bit of uh, goals that we have for this is there is a, uh, we have a design threat scheduled here for later this month that we welcome everyone <laughs> to involve here from five to seven on October, remind me of the date. 27th, uh, October 27th, th Thursday. Thank, thank you very much. Uh, so we welcome everyone, um, not only the DDA board, but the public to be involved in that. I'll lead that with uh, a bunch of uh, our company associates um, to work through that. So um, 
little background on the lumberyard site. It is at the corner of Atwater and South Broadway, also known as M24. Uh, Leo's Coney Island is on the corner of, of this parcel site. Uh, Lake Orion Lumber was effectively uh, developed or established in, in 1926 um, and has been around and has been essentially, as you see it here today, for over 80 years. Uh, the 4.2 acre site uh, has the opportunity to create, um, I guess, new economic investment for the downtown beyond uh, what it's contributed towards our historical fabric for the last 80 to 100 years. Um, I think, as I mentioned previously, the connection along the uh, Iron Belt Trail, the, the angle of this parcel that you see here in a couple of these images are actually the original railway that crossed over in the front of the downtown um, and, and might be an opportunity to uh, provide inspiration for a potential future scheme. With that said, um, as we're exploring these ideas, there's a lot of different thoughts that, that the DDA board and, and some of the public that had early involvement of, of what this parcel might become of, uh, what would we do with the parcel? And I think uh, starting in the upper left-hand corner, this is an inspiration board that we utilize. You know, what can we bring forth in this uh, potential development that celebrates our history and other opportunities that, that we could create? You know, the upper left celebrates the history, you know, even though it might not be present the way you see it today, you know, could it envision and help remind us what we were in the, in the past? Is there a way to celebrate our geography, uh, geographical location within um, the region and how Lake Orion contributed towards kind of that vacation town that we had for all of those years and, and the connection to the city of Detroit from the railway that led out to here? And, and not only can we celebrate that railway, but also maybe create new opportunities. Some of the images you see here in the middle that convert a railway into an art installation or it transitions into a gateway that could lead to downtown. Maybe in the lower right where you have this railway timeline that not only talks about our history, but maybe where we're going and just plays a little bit of homage from where we were and where we could head here in the future. Um, the, one of the goals here with this parcel would obviously be expanding upon the, the great events that we have here in the downtown. Um, I'm a longtime resident, so is Laura, and, and our company's been here for, for many years, and we love uh, the Village of Lake Orion. You know, the flower fair, car shows, Dragon on the Lake. You know, how does this potential development engage and provide uh, additional opportunities to, to really thrive with some of those events? You know, does it create a, a large covered pavilion that could be permanently in place that would be utilized for Dragon on the Lake, you know, for the beer pub tent or the flower fair, an opportunity for a covered area when those, those weather sequences don't really play in our favor. And, you know, is there an opportunity to place it somewhere along that trail where, you know, you have uh, all of the biking and trail runners that utilize the Paint Creek and how do we pull them into the downtown? Um, and, and we obviously know there would likely be some, some economic development, some buildings involved in this, maybe a pavilion, maybe some mixed-use structures. And we envision those to be um, respect the historical fabric of downtown in both kind of material and character. Um, you know, so it would be something that we would see in both, you know, size and scale to respect what we have downtown and build upon that. Maybe it isn't... Um, exactly a replica of a building we have downtown, but maybe it plays homage in height. Maybe it creates, as you see here, this lower image uh, on the lower level where it says market. You know, maybe there's a, a upper floor pavilion, something unique uh, that we don't really have in the downtown to, to create some more opportunities. So a couple of uh, just general concepts we've been exploring is, is how do we develop this site? You know, the first few pieces that we were looking at, right, were um, the idea of economic development, but also, you know, parking as a priority for the downtown, the connection to the trailway, you know, and, and what else can we do with this parcel? So this first scheme is uh, concept number one. We're calling it the angular scheme. It respects the red line would be essentially the original rails to trails um, uh, line where, where the railway used to cross through and, and right in front of downtown Lake Orion. We'd be proposing a couple of two-story buildings, about 12,000 square feet apiece. And that could be a number of different things. It could be offices, it could be retail, it could be a mix of residential. You know, each of those buildings on the second floor could have about six units, maybe about a thousand square feet. Um, and, and not to mention, um, you know, provide spaces that we don't always have in the downtown, some larger footprints, you know, something that's larger than the typical two to three thousand square foot spaces. 
Um, one other component that we envision happening is that kind of pavilion structure you see here in the, in the yellow. Maybe it's a combination of a pavilion with some covered parking that, that double dips. Maybe during the day it's used for parking and at night, you know, when a festival is, is present, we can utilize that for, for events when it's appropriate and, and get the most out of every square inch of this parcel. I made a little bit of conversation about these buildings. We envision them to be mixed use. Uh, so a, a lot could happen with those. The, the little triangle pieces on the north and south of these two buildings could obviously be an outdoor patio area or maybe a welcoming entrance or maybe it's a storefront or, or some picnic tables for an ice cream shop. Something that really promotes that community that we want in our downtown. Now, um, <clears throat> Not only with the development component is obviously the parking as a motivation for, for taking a look at some of this site. Um, he, you see here in this scheme we're proposing about 191 parking spaces. For a point of reference, Children's Park is about 66 parking spots. So just from a sense of scale, quite a bit more parking overall on this site than we have even when one of our largest parking uh, lots. Um, dwelling spaces, you know, every dwelling utilizes uh, usually about two parking spaces. So once you take out of the need uh, for this parcel between the retail and the residential, we're netting about 119 additional parking spaces downtown. Um, so that is not to mention still maintaining the um, existing trailway connection that's at the back of the parcel uh, that was installed about five or six years ago by the DDA in a partnership with the lumber yard and then also maintains the linear park out in front between essentially the purple buildings that you see in this plan and then also Leo's Coney Island and the parking lot. So, so some bigger uh, opportunities here that we see that maybe incorporates those art sculptures, um, you know, maybe some covered areas that create the opportunity for some additional outdoor market space. Um, a, lot of, a lot of different possibilities here. Another scheme that we're taking a look at is this concept two, which would be a concept plan, uh, or a campus plan, should I say, that explores uh, similar ideas, but in a different configuration. And a couple of benefits to this is that um, by, by placing buildings in different locations, we're not only respecting kind of that exist, existing trailway angular connection or that linear park that we've created along that Leo's parking lot, but also maybe creates an opportunity for a building you see here at, at kind of this upper left-hand corner of this plan, uh, which would be adjacent to Oat Soda. Maybe it's a, a gateway to the downtown. Again, this, this parcel would be completely self-sufficient with parking and along with creating additional parking for the downtown to create that sense of community and be able to draw people not only to this site, but also help supplement all the other businesses and activities we already have downtown. Um, that pavilion structure still, still would exist in, in both of these formats. Um, you know, we're looking at about a 4,000 4, square foot uh, multi-use event pavilion, which is similar uh, in size to what's being utilized for Dragon on the Lake right now in Children's Parking Lot. So that could be a permanent pavilion that gets placed there that is always available for events. You know, maybe that's completely open air. Maybe it's a combination of something that's more of a three season opportunity that we could propose. Um, with that said, you know, we're still envisioning these to be multi-purpose uh, buildings or with a mixed use is what we're promoting in the downtown. Maybe that front building up there in the upper left-hand corner has an a anchor restaurant on the lower level with residences <coughs> above a loft, uh, something a, a thousand square feet that a young professional or a small family would, would engage in. Maybe the building that's placed in, in the back of this scheme uh, incorporates some more office both on the first level and the second level. Maybe it promotes a small medical office, uh, something that you know, we would see benefiting all of the downtown here. Um, a third opportunity that we've created in this scheme is also taking a look in this back uh, corner of this parcel adjacent to Heritage Place Senior Apartments would be some townhouse style units. Uh, those would be comparable to what's over at the Orient Point building. Um, you know, maybe a, a 2,000 to 2,500 square foot townhouse, maybe a two car uh, attached garage, something that a family would be looking for that wants the downtown amenities and be walkable to the downtown district, but still connected to everything and still give them everything that they would maybe find elsewhere in the township or in other areas. Not, uh, not last uh, or least, but the parking uh, in this scheme, we get a little bit more parking by uh, taking and putting the buildings to kind of the corners of the parcel. Uh, we have about 246 parking spaces on this site. So again, as a point of reference, children's parking lot is about 66. 
Um, you know, and, and to also note, you know, any on-grade parking that would be installed would be a significantly lower price than anything if you had to ever go vertical in the downtown. So it would be about a fifth to a quarter of the cost actually to produce a, a on-grade parking space. So not only are you getting many parking spots, but also some ones that some, some good return on investment. Um, and in this scheme, not only after we're parking and providing the townhouses, but we're also providing another 152 parking spots that would supplement the downtown. Real quick, I'll kind of highlight this one. It's very similar to the last. We were exploring the idea of, of maybe incorporating, um, let's say, the, not incorporating the townhouses at the back. Um, by removing those, we, we gain about 34 parking spaces, so we net closer to 200 spaces. So. Um, as we continue to explore this and as we work towards our uh, workshop, I know, um, you know we're looking for some additional input. We're looking for some feedback on, on what amenities we would uh, want to provide on this parcel. And you know, it's ultimately a balance, right? Is, is our uh, number one priority parking or is it you know, some trailway space and some outdoor activity spaces with parking? And do we want to create that opportunity for maybe a public-private partnership where a developer could come in to say, all right, we're going to construct those residential units above and we've created a space for a great anchor restaurant in the downtown. For the most part, I know I was talking quite a bit and I went through a lot of information, but that's our general presentation. If you have any questions or comments, I'm, I'm here to provide answers. So appreciate your, uh, your time this evening. <clears throat> Anybody have any comments? Or any yes. Thank you. Scott and team, I love it. I think it's awesome. I think that um, it's a really good place for us to start a conversation with the residents. Um, and I hope we'll get lots of feedback on the 27th because um, this is a community project. Um, there's been discussion about it. And I think um, this, I can't, couldn't think of a better project for the DDA. And I'm excited because we were ready to move forward on a parking deck project that would be significantly more expensive than this and just give us 66 parking spots. And now we can really kind of design and create a beautiful gateway to our downtown that's been needed for a long time. So thank you for your work on this. I'm sure there'll be more to come. Yeah, we um, look forward I, to working. I think this is a great step in the right direction. <clears throat> Go ahead, Elena. Um, yeah, thank, again, I echo what Chris said, but thank you very much um, for the work that you've put into this um, to get us started. I'm really excited about the opportunity to engage the community. This is a parcel that we can control uh, what happens on that piece of property to benefit our community as a whole. And that is a huge opportunity. Um, for us, so I'm, I'm really excited about it. Thank you. Ken? I just want to mention, <clears throat> I'm glad that you're on board with us. Your firm has a legacy of uh, working within the community and uh, you're, you're, you live here, so we appreciate that. So, um, like the concept, there's a lot of work to be done, especially when you start looking at um, the financing and putting the numbers together, but I believe the community can do it. And I agree, it's a good opportunity for unity. That gateway control is pinnacle. And um, I can see nothing but benefits for us all as we go. The charrette, I'm really excited about that because that's going to give us some opportunities to get some possible new ideas that mm -hmm. would really be cool. So, and buy it. I mean, that's an opportunity for the public to come here and, and uh, you know, give their opinions about the the grandeur and the, the true beauty that can be created through this project. So look forward to it. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I'd like to just make a comment that, you know, you guys are, are visionaries with this project and, you know, the pleasure is all ours to be able to, to not only work and live in our community, but, you know, this is what we love to do is, is help build community. It's one of the things we've always prided ourselves on, but, you know, this is not uh, the only community that we've done this in. Um, there's been other communities, the city of Fenton that we've worked with, we've worked with MEDC and other projects to, to really grow um, and, and help steer certain parcels that could become a catalyst to your community in the right direction and really gain the, the greatest benefit, right, of, of one that's not just purely economically driven, but also one that can have those other benefits, one that considers 
the bigger picture of parking with the downtown or the, the idea that we are on the trailhead on, on the Pan Creek Trail and that we still want to create a future investment in the downtown also. Can, can I make one more comment? I, I think that um, my personal preference would be we do pursue public-private partnerships. We've done that in the past recently with 51 North. Um, I personally don't want to see the DDA own and hold land for a long time, but to get a project like this started, mm -hmm. kind of minimize it, um, bring in other partners, and pay back the debt, which I think um, with a project like this, I think, I think it's realistic that we could do that in a matter of a few years if we find the right partners. Um, that would be my personal preference that we do that. Um, and I think that, I think that this project really sets it itself up nicely for that. And we know the recent history. We know there are other developers that have looked at this site over the last few years. Um, all the way through the planning approval process, they were denied because it was too dense. And I love that what we're proposing is open space, community space, mixed use, not cramming everything we could cram on the site. And I think we can do all those things and um, break even or maybe even potentially, you know, pay this thing off sooner than later. So I think it's really setting itself up for a nice project that I'm excited about. And I, yeah. I, I just want to say the rest of the DDA board, I know there's been some discussion in the community, but I think this is what we're, this is specifically um, a project that DDAs are created to do. And I know that some people were able to visit Fenton. I wasn't yet, but I've heard that's a really great example of a project we should look to. Yeah, real quick, Chris, I was going to add that, that even their initial investment, they've seen now that they're, uh, that that project was completed in 2014, you know, so there are significant ways out and they've seen, they were very happy with the investment and the efforts that they made up front that's led to the payoff long term. And, and now that they've seen all of the interest furthermore in their downtown to people to, to kind of keep raising the bar, you know, and, and if you talk with them, that's, that's one of their most exciting things is, is they're happy they set the bar and they're happy that um, they're able to continue that journey. And if I could. Thank you. Go ahead, Hink. Um, you know, AKA is a terrific firm. Um, they actually built my condo. Um, some of the ideas he's proposing today, I, I kind of see them in the, in the back corner, <laughs> okay? And I think probably it's, it's great for the community, but it's also great for me, because when I sit in my office, I won't see that lumber sign anymore. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Ken? The uh, public-private partnership is um, of high interest to me. And because of the obvious, <clears throat> uh, uh, but what I like to, what I think about occasionally is they have skin in the game. And if we partner up with the right person, we don't have good expertise in the development or possibly some of the uh, uh, amenities of that site and they can bring that to the table. So I'm looking forward to that as well as the possibility for the public-private, a P3 as they're known. Yeah. They've been very successful in many communities. Yes. And uh, well spoken about at the county level and state level and uh, of high interest. <coughs> Molly? Um, I wanted to thank um, AKA for arranging for us to go to Fenton to speak to um, the managers there. Um, they have done some very creative things um, and, and they, what they have um, described their projects as creative and courageous, um, meaning that if, uh, if their projects didn't um, work the way they had hoped they would, they might have to go find another job. And they still felt that those were, they were good projects to do despite the risk. Um, and uh, at the village council meeting last night, there was a lot of discussion about um, community um, involvement and how to how to make sure that MDC, MEDC can see the community buy-in. Well, this so I asked a lot of questions about that um, from Fenton and um, our providing the parking lot, our um, doing the detailed architectural plans, um, showing people exactly what we want, um, what we want those developers to make. All of those things are um, a community contribution and a community involvement. And, um, and it takes, it can take the conversation about PA-210s off the table, which I know Lake Orion would love to do. 
Um, and I, I was really um, pleased to hear about all of those different options that they were offering. Um, we're still in the due diligence phase of this project. Um, due diligence ends January 5th, 2023. Um, in addition to the design charrette, um, we, have, uh, we have a resolution that we need to pass and then we need to request the same, well, we need to request that the village issue those bonds. Um, and we really need, this is, a, this is a true partnership. We need the cooperation and and belief and trust um, in what we're trying to do um, with the, with, from Village Council. Um, we have not yet received um, phase one environmental report from AKT Peerless, um, and, but I, and we're expecting that once we do, we will also immediately o um, order the phase two um, based on the, uh, what we think the history of this property is. So those are all things that are coming up. Please invite all of your friends to the October 27th, Thursday night, um, 5 to 7 p.m. here in the Nepal. Um, we're looking forward to seeing everybody there um, so we can um, fine tune um, the direction that we take and get a lot of public participation. Thank you. Chris? Thank you. And we have been recently gone through this project at the town, or this process at the township, and I'm very familiar with it. It's how projects like this get done. So. Um, if it would please the, the board, I would like to move the adoption of the resolution in our packet re requesting issuance of bonds and pledging tax increment of revenues. It's attached um, here in our um, packets. I won't read it all, but it is available on our website as well if people would like to see it. And further um, to receive and file the bond Q&A. <coughs> and also at our places tonight, there is a um, rough estimate of what the financing looks like in the annual um, debt service requirement of the DDA. And I would just include that that's in our packet and it would be included in the minutes as well for reference of the public. That's my motion. Um, can we additionally uh, receive and file the AK, AKA architects? Yes. Um, presentation and including re referencing in the minutes that we did receive a presentation um, from AKA architects second um, I think we should offer public comment at, at this time once we have a, well, now we have a motion and then I'll give I think then I'll give one more comment at the end of that okay any public comment Um, I would just say, just to, for people here or watching from home, um, this isn't a done deal. This is just one of the dozen or so steps in the process. Um, we still are going through our due diligence, there, you know, um, on the environmentals and things. So, but it all has to happen in a very specific order. The the company that we're consulting with, ben, Benzinski and Company, they, that's all they do is is municipal finance with Michigan. Cities, villages, townships, counties, school districts. This, the, they, they are basically the company. Um, so we've got good advice, um, engaged with village council, and we'll continue to do that as well. So thank you. Molly. <clears throat> Hi, um, Jeff Aronoff is here um, to talk about um, the bond process. Um, this is the first time we've gone through it, so I thought it would be good to have him discuss this with us. Thank you, Molly. I'm Jeff Aronoff. I'm a principal at Miller Canfield, Paddock and Stone. We're bond counsel to the village and the DDA. I've been in front of this body before, not too long ago, talking about parliamentary procedure. Um, I think we talked about paint colors as an example of uh, how to introduce a motion. Um, in any case, the, um, it's good to be in front of you again. And for those of you that I haven't seen before, hello. Um, so this resolution that's in front of you is the first step in the process of issuing DDA bonds that are secured by tax increment revenues. Ultimately, the legal issuer of the bonds would be the village. Uh, the way this works is that there are really two sources of security for bondholders, meaning that's what they get paid out of. 
Uh, primarily, the expectation would be bondholders would be paid out of tax increment revenues of the DBA. But as I'm sure uh, you've been advised, I know you've been advised by um, Benzinski, it is very difficult, um, I don't want to say impossible, but very rare these days uh, to have a what we would call a naked TIF, that is to say a bond issue that is secured only by tax increment revenues. More often, almost always, the bonds are <clears throat> primarily secured by the tax increment revenues, but ultimately backed up by the full faith and credit of the incorporating municipality, in this case the village. And that is why DDA tax increment revenue bonds secured by a general obligation pledge of the village, in this case, are ultimately issued by the village. And so the first step is for an initial resolution by the DDA, this is what's in front of you, requesting that the village issue bonds secured by both the tax increment revenues, which you would be pledging through this resolution, and then backed up by the general obligation pledge of the village. This would be the last resolution or formal action of the DDA board with respect to the bond issue now. There may be contracts and project components, of course, that come in front of this board. But in terms of uh, what steps the DDA board itself needs to take, this is the one step. And then there would be one resolution adopted by the village council, which would have more details of the bond issue, the, the, the uh, tax covenants and some, some repetition of what's in here. Um, but some more details with respect to the bonds, and then that would delegate to certain officers uh, of the village and the DDA to finish the bond issue, to sign the documents, to sell the bonds within the approved financial parameters of the village council. So DDA takes the first step, that gets the ball moving, and that's what's in the resolution in front of you, and I've probably taken more time to talk than it would take to read the resolution, which is only about a page and a half long, so I'll shut up and uh, take any questions you might have. We also worked with Miller Canfield uh, as the bond council, um, so they're the legal side, and Benzinski is the, um, not the issuer of bonds, but they're the- They're the financial the initial, advisor, the municipal financial advisor. advisor, yeah. yeah right. Yeah, I just want to reiterate exactly what you said, sir. This is just a step in a process. It takes it to the village council. It's a necessary step in order for it to go to higher review and consideration that's right. for the good of the community. And that's all this is. This is not a, an approval of the bonds at this time. It's to bring all of the information together, get it out there, and have it accepted or not by the council for the good of the community. If only this resolution were adopted, there would be no authorization to do anything. Right. Right. This is the this is a necessary first step, but uh, without the village, the the bond authorizing resolution of the village, which would be up for consideration in a couple weeks, there'd be no authorization to issue bonds at all. Right. And then uh, after this as well, it will go to the village attorneys for legal review, full scrutiny. Yeah, I mean, well, we, we are, we, as bond counsel, we, the cl our client is the DDA in the village. Uh, the village general counsel is always uh, involved and invited to look at everything, right. certainly, but uh, we have a, a duty as the attorneys representing both the DDA and the village to, you know, conduct the full legal review. And, and when the uh, bonds are, are issued, there is an approving opinion that is uh, delivered at closing. Every purchaser in, in the country that purchases municipal bonds from the smallest bank to the largest municipal bond underwriter on Wall Street uh, requires the same approving opinion of bond council and we deliver that opinion and the custom is you only deliver that opinion on documents that you drafted. So um, that's sort of what the transaction ultimately hinges on. Thank you. I have a question. Sure. I'm not sure if I'm asking the right person or not, but you can tell me if I'm in error. Is there a cap for Lake Orion or the village as far as how much can be bonded? So for the village as a whole or how much for the DDA? Well, if the village and the DDA, let's say they're together, sure. really. So if you combined both of them, is there a cap? 
Yeah, the answer is yes. So there's a couple caps. Let me talk about what those are. Uh, there is, under the DDA plan, only $5 million of DDA-related debt can be incurred, okay? But when there is a, uh, a village general obligation pledge, as there would be here, that would count against the village's overall limit. I think Stephen ran the numbers on that. Okay, so uh, the village's overall debt limit based on its state equalized value is about $20 million. Uh, that's 10%, the, just to give you the, the legal reference to that, that's 10% of the state equalized value of all property in the village. And so the overall limit would be $20 million. So this would count against that for the village because it's pledging its full faith and credit. So it, it counts both against that DDA cap under the plan and the village's overall debt limit. Sir, in that, in your statement though, uh, it does say there's two different DDA bonds issued by the village and capital improvement bonds issued by the village. With the capital improvement, it's 10%, which is the same 20 million, but it can also have an additional 5% debt limit, which would be 30 million. Well, no, it actually works the other way around. So capital, these are not capital improvement bonds. Okay. Capital improvement bonds would be not secured by TIF revenues, okay? Those would just be general obligation. Now, there's a little, there's a little nuance here, okay? Mm -hmm. Capital improvement bonds are, are general obligation bonds of the village payable by any, from any source, taxes, whatever they have coming into their general fund which could include transfers of funds from the DDA to the, the city, or the village, rather. It's, so it's, it's very similar. Like, the, if, if the expectation would be, look, these are being paid out of tax increment revenues, but it's the city's full faith and credit that, you know, the, the purchaser's ultimately relying on, capital improvement bonds and, and village DDA bonds with a, a general obligation pledge are, are very similar. But that 5% that you're referencing is not an additional uh, debt limit. Capital improvement bonds are subject to the overall debt limit, but within that debt limit can only be issued at 5%. In other words, uh, capital improvement bonds are the most versatile kind of general kind of bonds you can issue. They have a lower um, threshold of their own. So you'd have a total, the village would have a total capital improvement bond limit of $10 million. If $20 million is the is the 10% limit, then 10, 10 million should be the 5% limit for capital improvement bonds. So for that category of bonds, it's 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 the, the 10 million or 5%. That is not a, in addition to the overall debt limit that's within the overall debt limit. Just like the DDA $5 million, you know, pursuant to your TIF plan is also within the, the village's uh, overall limit. There's nothing that allows you, at least if there's a, a village general obligation pledge, there's nothing that would allow you to exceed that limit. Any other limits you find are going to be within that overall 10% limit of the village with exceptions that really don't apply to anything you're considering. So it's probably not worth talking about. And did then, that make sense or did yeah, I throw does. too much and, at and you? And then what if we entered into some public-private partnership, sold part of it, kind of minimized the development, generated revenue. Can we prepay the bond debt? Can we set it up so that we could prepay? And or the other option could be if we did that, we could pay the village potentially, correct? Uh, so there's two, two, two questions there. So, so bonds are almost always issued with a uh, what we call a, an early redemption or optional right. redemption feature. Mm -hmm. It's usually not right away, though. Uh, the the bondholder usually likes to guarantee that, hey, I'm pricing this based on what interest rates look like, and I want to guarantee that I'm going to get that rate if they're 15-year bonds. I want to make sure I get that rate for seven years, something yeah. like that. So you may be able to pay early, but not, like, right away. Right. When you say pay the village... Well, let's say loan. <laughs> let's say... <laughs> they wanted to do a project that maybe was over the total, let's say we're bonding for five million, leaves mm -hmm. 15 million, following up on Ken's question. Let's just say they needed 17. I'm just making stuff up. The $2 million Delta, if we had a partner, I, you get what I'm saying? Yeah, so. Inter, um, intergovernmental. Yeah, so let's, 
I would caution you to, to stay away from something we call an intergovernmental loan well, under these circumstances. I don't know the right but, thing to say. But, I, I, but, let's, but I'm, let's I'm put, asking the question because there's critics that are saying, sure. you know, we don't want to prevent the village from being able to do capital projects they need to do, and it's a legitimate concern and question. Sure. And this might be a way to address that. I, I could um, tail off that a little bit because sure. in the resolution, it, and I think this is similar to what Chris is asking, it could says, you put your mic down so we could hear you please? In the resolution, I believe this is similar to what Mr. Barnett is asking, the request to issue bonds pledge of tax increment revenues, there's a statement that says, the village determines that it is the best interest of the village to redeem all or any portion of the bonds prior to maturity. The DDA may, but shall not be required to prepay its obligations authorized herein, so it would be like early payment. Yeah, that's the first scenario we were talking about. Right. That, right. that early redemption, though, it would probably wouldn't be, you know, the bonds are going to have what we call call features or early redemption right. features that the, that the investor will require. So absolutely, that there's no question that you can, if, if there is a buildup of extra funds, right. uh, and there's other circumstances in which you, you may refinance, like if interest rates go down, you issue, it's like refinancing a mortgage, right? You can issue what we call refunding bonds just to lower the interest rate. That really doesn't even change much other than lower the debt service payment. However, if there are excess tax increment revenues available, those can be applied to an early, like using just cash on hand rather than a refinancing to uh, redeem bonds early. But that'll still be um, limited by the, the, the call features or the early payment features in the bonds where the bondholder will say, I'm not getting paid off any earlier than seven years. Mm. Um, just mm -hmm. as a, that's like a market-based feature. But I thought we were, we were on a, maybe a second scenario where if uh, some other kind of, uh, for, and if I'm misinterpreting it, uh, correct me, but it sounded like we were on a second scenario where, okay, we've got the bond issues one thing, but maybe there are other village projects that may overlap with the DDA's objectives and the plan. Is there a way to, for the DDA to support village projects financially in addition to this? Is you, that, said that, you said that way better than I, That's okay. what I was trying to say. You said it more, more eloquently, yes. So this is what I tell every tax increment entity that uh, whether it's a DDA, an LDFA, a TIFA, less brownfield authorities, but them too. <coughs> if, if your tax increment revenues if you have tax increment revenues available for something that is consistent with the plan, and remember your plan is what triggers your ability to capture tax increment revenues, then you can use the money for the plan. And if that overlaps with a village priority, there are ways that we would be able to create some contract between the DDA and the village to use those tax increment revenues in support of a village project that also is like a consistent with the DDA plan that that aren't DDA debt, right? right? That's not like we're talking about here, the, the $5 million. You're not going to be able to borrow more or the village, neither the village nor the DDA will be able to borrow more than $5 million bucks secured by DDA TIF revenues. But there are other ways to use tax increment revenues that are available to you if you have them to support projects consistent with the plan. Perfect. Okay. And that is more of a discussion for the committee between the village and the DDA, but it's something that's been discussed and will be continue to be. But that's good information. Thank you. Yeah, and sir, so, and then also you mentioned earlier, you made a statement about transfers out of the DDA to village. What was that? Well, th mean? that was just in, in response to this question of are there <laughs> ways for the, vil the DDA to mm -hmm. support other projects that are not DDA bond projects. And there are a number of ways those can be paid for. Like, let's, you know, we have clients right. where. But is it as simple as a transfer or does it need to be uh, consistent with the DDA plan? Well, it has to be consistent with the DDA plan. I just okay. use the word transfer in uh, alternate to using the word loan. Okay. I, I wouldn't want to use that, that term. Um, but the, the DDA, I think the, 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 the broad concept here is the DDA can pay for things consistent with the plan. Sometimes that is the DDA hiring contractors to do, I don't know, facade improvements in the DDA district. Sometimes that is the DDA in partnership with its incorporating municipality taking on a project cooperatively. 
And that's where I use the term transfer, where some mechanism by which DDA funds can be contributed to a project that may be headed by the village, let's say. These are just scenarios. We're really just kind of walking through possible scenarios here but that are also consistent with the DDA plan. All of that's in the discretion of the, both the DDA board and the village, but those are tools in the toolbox. But I would, I would not say we make a, that, the, that the DDA makes a loan to the village. That's just, that, that's, maybe that's a little cloudier terminology than I would. Sorry for the wormhole, but that no, was helpful, Joe. Yeah, thank sure. you. Does that, does that answer the question? I'm good, yes, thank okay. you. Molly? Could you discuss um, what the difference is between these bonds and uh, revenue bonds? Sure. So revenue bonds are uh, bonds that are secured by some project. Well, the revenue is generated by some project, not tax increment revenues. Because tax increment revenues, even though the, the word revenue is in like the description, those are really just captured tax levies, right? Revenue bonds are bonds that are secured by uh, the actual, like, earned revenue of some enterprise system. So the, the most common uh, type of revenue bond, and this isn't applicable to DDAs, but the most common type of revenue bond is, like, water and sewer bonds, right? Those are, those are revenue-generating uh, enterprise systems where you finance improvements that don't involve the full faith and credit of the municipality. They are just secured by whatever the water and sewer system um, earns. A good example of revenue bonds that you sometimes see issued by DDA would be like parking revenue bonds, right? Sometimes parking um, structures may be, or, or parking systems or parking assets may be part of a DDA plan, right? Downtown parking, that sort of thing. A parking system or parking structure is a revenue generating asset. And so if you're financing the, the development of a parking structure, you can issue revenue bonds that are secured by the revenues earned by that parking structure. That would be an example of revenue bonds. There's no, that's not TIF, that's not general obligation bonds of the village. In fact, uh, actually to one of our earlier discussions, revenue bonds, we talked about um, uh, uh, bonds that might not be subject to that debt limit we talked about a little a little while ago. Revenue bonds are not subject to the debt limit because they're not secured by the full faith and credit of the village. That's like a closed loop. It's it's revenue of the asset really, rather than rev than um, the, the financial sort of strength of the village or the DDA. So that's a another long winded example of a, of revenue bonds. Does that address the question? Yes. Thank you. Does one get a better interest rate than the other? Uh, revenue bonds usually have a, a higher, that is a worse interest rate because that's a narrower. G general obligation bonds get the best rate okay. because that's the widest, widest security. It's the full, you know, it's it's the full kind of financial strength of the of the issuer. What can that be like? Uh, a difference of twenty percent in the interest rate, or what? Uh, that depends on a lot, and the Benzinski team would be better at answering it in terms of the, the, the actual kind of quantitative answer, but I'll tell you what it, it depends on a little bit. You may have a very strong enterprise system that has a lot of users in a relatively weak community, like in terms of property tax values, right? So in that case... Um, you know, the actually one, they're not, it's not always a good example for a lot of things, but just by way of like illustration, let's, let's pretend this was 20 years ago. In Detroit, the Tro Detroit Water and Sewerage Department, the, the water and sewer system was actually a very strong revenue system, whereas the city's general obligation is very weak. The, you know, water and sewer revenue bonds are still narrower than a general obligation, but the, the, uh, the spread between the two would be much closer, right? So you might have a strong asset in a weak community. In other cases, you might have a very wealthy community with high property tax values. But let's say uh, a, a lot of the users are, let's say it's a, let's say it's a wealthier rural community where you have a lot of um, maybe high property values, but maybe a low usage of a system, a lot of people on septic uh, and, and wells, that sort of thing. So you might have a, 
uh, an issuer that would have a really good rating on its general obligation, but the system usage would be low. In that case, the spread between the two would be wider. So that's not, I can't give you a number really, um, but, but suffice to say that revenue is always going to be narrower and more expensive to issue because it's narrower credit than general obligation. Thank you. Molly? Um, what, what about um, borrowing from the state? Is that an opportunity with the municipality? Um, with the municipality, yeah. Uh, for DDA projects, generally, no. So there are um, the, the major state borrowing programs are like the, the revolving fund programs that are partnerships between <laughs> Treasury and Eagle, Environmental, Great Lakes, and uh, Energy. Those are state programs where you borrow money, you're actually issuing bonds to the state, but those are for very traditional water and sewer improvements, generally, um, that have a, a kind of a positive environmental impact. There are, um, we've done a little bit of this, and I don't, I don't, I don't want to suggest that it's common or easy or even would be available to Lake Orion, but... In recent years, we have worked on a couple of transactions where there are MEDC loan programs for economic development that are designed for private commercial borrowers. You know, you're a developer and you're going to develop your um, manufacturing facility in the city of Bug Tussle, and um, normally you can go to MEDC to... to get a, a certain kind of loan. MEDC has shown a little bit of a willingness to kind of um, re, repackage or kind of tweak those loan programs a little bit where the borrowers, instead of commercial like companies, have been municipalities that are kind of, and, and actually in fact TIF authorities that are like, like DDAs that are doing economic development uh, programs. Um, for, for legal compliance purposes, there'd have to still be like a bond issue to the MEDC, and we kind of build those on a kind of bespoke, customized basis, but they still have to square with like the basic statutory constraints that we're even talking about now for the bonds that, were, that are in front of you. That was the answer to your question, but I don't want to well, suggest that that's I think common. We're we the can... waters. I, I think maybe a good final question would be, in your recommendation, this is what you do for municipalities all over. What's the best course of action for the type of project we're looking to do? In your opinion, yeah, this is this is the this is how we do it, where we do a TIF pledge backed by a GO of the municipality. Right. But your explanation of the uh, hybrid, I'm going to call it, through the MEDC, might be something that could be utilized in a different scenario, not this DDA quest to. Um, have this improvement to the community and, and uh, build some good unity and, sure. and uh, beautification. Yeah, th those take a long runway and a lot of and, lot And of I can tell you yeah. they've completely changed since they passed legislation to support GM. I'm really familiar with that. So that's, that's why I kind of wanted to ask you the last that question I asked because I, I think we might be potentially muddying the waters a little bit with a, a lot of these, some of these. But, but it's really good, rec I mean, we should always look at all options, but so, um, Thank you. And, I, and my, my last comment, and I, maybe we can vote, was um, it would be really great if you could attend the village council meeting when they discuss this, because I'm sure they're going to have probably a lot of the same questions. Hopefully they'll watch this meeting and hear the answers to the questions, but maybe to you or some of sure your I'm sure you're finding correct. That's the 24th, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. I'll be there. Here. Oh, be yes. Here. All right. Right in there. Right on that bench. <laughs> Thank you. Sure. Okay. Do we have a motion? It was. Yep. The original motion. Okay. And uh, Matt, I think, supported it. Yeah. So I, I'm going to ask for a roll call on this, please. Campbell? Yes. Laurent? Yes. Medina? Yes. Van Portfleet? Yes. Burgess? Yes. Shell? Yes. Barnett? Yes. Motion carries 7 0. Thank you. Moving on to downtown lamp post retrofit approval, page 66 of the packet. 
All right, one of the priorities of the DDA board this year was to improve pedestrian safety by increasing the ambient lighting um, from the downtown lampposts. Um, we have um, Joe Monsoor, who is a DTE consultant, um, who's been assigned to um, Lake Orion to um, look at our different lighting needs. Um, he came in and he gave us, he kind of took readings of what our, what our lighting was offering us. And then we were able to do some test bulbs at the intersection of Front and Broadway. And he did some test readings again. And we, we decided on a direction and it was a two-pronged direction. Um, our ultimate goal is to increase the lighting, the ambient lighting, so as people are coming through, walking through downtown, they feel safe and they can see um, where they're going. Um, the first, the first way, the first thing that we asked for in our bid was for um, specific lighting that we knew was going to increase the ambient lighting between the lamp posts. The second thing that we asked for was their best idea for how to be um, dark sky compliant because the solution that we came up with um, provided more ambient lighting but it was not necessarily dark sky compliant. Um, the bids came in, there were 10 different bids. Um, there is an overview attached. Um, this is a retrofit from the direct wire that we have right now um, to a mobile base which is a screw-in a screw-in light bulb. Um, what, what has happened um, to our light bulbs over time is um, they're still LED and they're still working, but they're getting dimmer. And that's why over time um, it has started to feel darker in downtown, especially in our nine months of winter. I'm, I'm kidding, it's not really nine months, but we have a long time where it gets dark at 4.30. <laughs> so um, that's why we were looking at it. There were three vendors, and, and Joe Monsieur is here um, to talk about um, the, the differences in the proposal. Um, Joe, if you'd like to come up. We'll start with um, Kimberly LED lighting, which is this style of light bulb. And for those of you who were able to go through town and look at our test area, um, these lights are on the Lucky's and um, that's about chocolate side of the street on that intersection. Yes. So hi, I'm Joe Munsour. I am a contracted employee of the DTE, like Molly stated. Um, I work on the incentive and rebate side. Uh, my program does outreach to a lot of large users, uh, municipalities, commercial, industrial, uh, DTE customers. And uh, I know Lloyd Co. personally. He, uh, after I moved here, he asked me what I do for a living. And I told him, and he's like, I would like to see if we could get involved. So that's kind of what started my uh, work with the DDA. Um, the project that was brought to my attention, as Molly stated, was wanting to increase uh, the light levels throughout the village. Um, the first thing I did was took a look at what you currently have, and what those are are 60 watt um, strip fixtures that are direct wired into the post. Uh, it was done by a company in Oxford that is no longer in business, so they are no longer serviceable. It was done back in 2016, I believe. Um, and the big problem with those lights are one, they, if they there's nothing you can replace them. You have to go to something like this or to another post top direct wired retrofit. Um, if you wanted to replace them, you can't go to the company that did it because, like I said, they're no longer in business. Um, and what I started to do was, as Molly stated, looked at what light levels you currently have and then what could you do within your budget to achieve those light levels. Um, as a disclosure, I am a DTE contractor. I am a third party impartial. I'm, I can't make any recommendations on what to, for, to tell you to go with. All I can do is answer your questions. Um, <coughs> because I can't speak on behalf of DTE for you know, what decision you decide to make. However, I can give you all the information, the pros and cons of each. Um, with the current lights, I'll start here. Um, one big problem with that type of fixture is delamination of the LED strips. So there are six light bars on each fixture and they are laminated onto each bar, LED, uh, eight LED, no, a strip consisting of eight LEDs. 
Uh, once those start to delaminate due to heat buildup over time, that's when you start to, as Molly stated, have degradation of light levels. Uh, another problem that I can't for sure speak to, but I can make an assumption on, is that when the project was completed to upgrade the, the old metal halide or high pressure sodium bulbs to these LEDs, the contractor looked at the light levels that were existing and matched that light level with LED to maximize the savings, which is one common way to do these types of projects, especially you know, six, seven, eight years ago. Uh, the landscape of, and the, the, the market of LEDs has greatly changed in the last five years and is changing every day. So um, the current light levels are, I measured in foot candles. To give you an idea what a foot candle is, is if you held up a candlestick, lit candlestick, and around, a foot around, radi or a uh, diameter around that you know, candle, the, the light level that it gives off, that is one foot candle. If you measure the dead zones between the lights, so uh, you know, they're about 30 to 45 feet apart, so in the middle of those you have anywhere between a half and 0.3 foot candles, so less light than a candlestick. If you measure uh, directly around the lights, you have anywhere between 0.75 and one foot candle when you take the light meter and you point it directly at the light. If you take it at ground level, uh, parallel to the surface, it's more uh, around um, between uh, 0.5 to 0.65 foot candles. Um, so what we aim to do at first was test lights um, that you see before, like the corn cob lights that use less energy, so we started with 45 watt bulbs so that you would save energy and still increase, see if we can still increase the light level. However, to do that, you have to have uh, color temperature. Uh, color temperature is measured in Kelvin, so uh, five, uh, uh, dim or yellow light, which we'll go into with this one option, um, standard white light or bright white light, um, 33,000 Kelvin, 4,000 Kelvin, 5,000 Kelvin respectively. The lights that we tested were 45 watt, 5,000 Kelvin lights. We did four of those on each corner. And that gave you a reading of anywhere between 1.1 1 .1 and 1.3 foot candles. So about a 30% increase um, of what you currently have while still reducing your energy consumption by about 15 watts per bulb. Uh, however, we wanted to see what else we could do, um, see what else was out there while still saving energy. So we, we uh, did another test, uh, which was the, before the, the two um, other lights that we're demoing now, which we'll get into in a minute here. Uh, but we did a, a 35 watt, or 34 watt, a 64 watt, a 45 watt, and a 54 watt to kind of give us a general idea of you know, what works within your lamppost. And the one that we settled on that would meet the requirements the best was the 54 watt, still saves a little bit of energy versus the 60 watt. Um, however, it gives you about a 35 to 45 percent, or 35 to 40 percent increase in light level, uh, while still saving a little bit of energy. That is the option that Molly brought up first. That's what you see uh, here before you is these corn cob, corn cob style bulbs. So you would uh, have to retrofit the current lamp lamp posts to screw in type versus direct wire, and um, yeah, uh, they give you about, like I said, 35 to 45 percent increase. It's hard to tell until all the lamps are done and then you can go, I can go out and take more readings and tell you exactly um, because the, you know, it compounds itself the more light you have in that increased wattage. Um, I'll talk. All right. Okay. Um, so Kimberly LED Lighting, um, they proposed this corn cob style of LED. Um, the cost would be $29,446 for the total project. Um, if you have looked, um, it is the bright light color. Um, there's a 30% increase over the current lighting. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. Um, Kimberly LED offered a 10-year warranty. Um, that is the most years uh, offered by um, any of the contractors. And there's no increase to our utility bill. Yes. Want to move on to home electric? or uh, One other. Sorry. Go ahead. Molly, those were the lights at Lucky's and Chocolate? Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, one other thing to note, the bulbs that we're testing right now by uh, the ones that are by Lucky's and Nuts About Chocolate are 5,000 color temperature, uh, meaning they have more lumens per watt, brightness, the measure of brightness of lights. Um, in order to be semi-dark sky compliant, like well, I'm sure we'll talk about in a, in a minute here, 
the requirement, the two, there's two requirements, one light directed downwards, two has to be 3000 Kel color temperature, Kelvin color temperature or less. Um, so by going with a 54 watt bulb, 3000 Kelvin color temperature, you're almost, you're halfway there to dark sky compliance, but you're still increasing your light levels. Now, if you went with a 54 watt bulb that was 4,000 or 5,000 Kelvin, um, doesn't increase the cost by more than a, a couple dollars a, uh, a bulb, uh, you would have more light. So it all, it, it depends on which way you want to go with the dark sky compliance versus the brightness of the bulbs. All right, and in, um, in my director's report on page 18 of the packet, there is a picture of um, light pollution. Um, the corn cob, um, the one that Kimberly LED is, present, is proposing is, would be very similar to the capped, um, the capped, which is the unshielded, gives us a nice big gigantic glow, uh, bowl, globe. The second and one. And the second one, this is the one that we would be, that Kimberly is suggesting that we asked for. And it's, um, it still does um, project up into the, up, upwards a little bit. Yeah, if you take a look at these, you can see that there are LEDs on the top. Um, more, more so, you know, uh, around the, the corn cob itself. Um, the bulbs or the, the covers of your post do block some of that light as well. If you, if you, if you look at the lights um, that are by Lucky's and Nuts About Chocolate, you can see not, there's not a lot of light escaping the top, but there is some versus what we have demoed across the street where all the lights directed downward. So it looks like half that post top is, is uh, bright. Okay, let's move on to Helm Electric. Um, they um, provided a dark sky compliant downlight LED. They are located, our test um, lights are located at the Main Street Bikes and Burwood. They are a warm color. They provided a 50% increase over our current lighting. They have a five year warranty and they do increase our utilities by $800. Um, the calculation for this approval a proposal includes all the lampposts needed um, needing to be retrofit. Um, with the corn cob style, um, we have some mogul bases that are a different diameter. Uh, Is that smaller, Re smaller more versus residential versus commercial. So these are what's called uh, E30 or E28 mogul bases. They're they're bigger, more heat dissipation. Um, all the heat dissipation in these fixtures pretty much come from your your, your, uh, your screw in on the bottom. Um, the other ones, you if you go with uh, a corn cob, you don't have to retrofit the ones that have already been retrofitted to the, the screw in type. You can just buy the same style with the smaller Small base. Thing. However, it, like Molly said, if you go with the Satco lights that are demoed by the bike shop in Verwood, uh, those ones only come in that's that base so then all the lights would have to be um, changed to that screw in type that larger screw in type okay talk some more about the satco light please okay so the satco light is something that was new um, i wasn't even aware that it existed and it wasn't something that i looked into myself because i was only looking at less than 60 watt bulbs um, these lights, uh, the SACO lights that are being demoed are 70 watts, so it's an additional 10 watts a bulb above what you currently use, which is the, why you would have an increase in energy cost. However, um, all the light is directed downward, and they are 27 or 2,700 Kelvin color temperature, which is, it exceeds the requirements for dark sky compliance while still increasing the light levels above. I, I, I say conservatively 50% because I need more installed and take more readings to, to know for sure. I think it'll be more than that, but it would definitely at least increase your light levels by 50%. Even though by appearance, they don't look it, it's because your eyes are being tricked because the color temperature is 27,000 Kelvin versus 5,000 Kelvin across the street. Um, with those lights, like I said, they, all the light is directed downwards. So you do not have anything escaping out the top uh, light pollution wise. Um, those lights are, uh, I forgot to mention, these 54 watt, 3000 Kelvin bulbs that we're talking about with the other options are 7,200 lumens per watt. Your current bulbs are 5,200 lumens per watt. So you have over a 2,000 lumen per watt increase with that. The Satco bulbs that, you're, that we're trialing by Verwood and the bike shop are 10,300 lumens per watt. Quite a bit difference. 
um, the reason why you, you're not blinded by them is because of the color temperature. So uh, some reasons why um, municipalities like the, the dark sky compliant lights um, and, and the, the, the warmer color temperature is because it looks more historic. It kind of matches what you, uh, if you remember back to what you had before 2016, um, I can't speak to because I didn't live here at the time. Um, I would guess though by you know the, the color temperature of metal halide high pressure sodium, it, they're more of that, that warm color temperature, especially when they were first installed. Um, so you kind of get back to that historic look. You have um, double the lumen per watt output of what you currently have installed. And like I said, all the lights directed downward. The other good thing about those fixtures and, and from a maintenance and reliability perspective is that you, you said there was a picture in the? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And that's my question about page 18. What does that look like in the? Uh, uh, it's the partially stand? shielded. Yes. It's the, this one. The third one. The okay. third one. Yes. Got it. Yeah. It's 100% dark sky compliant. Um, and if you look at the picture, all of the, it has heat sinks. So you have the, the flat part uh, of, the, of the fixture itself, the LEDs are underneath. That whole entire surface is a heat sink, which will dissipate the heat a lot better than just a screw in fixture. So even though it's only rated for five year <laughs> warranty, 50,000 hours of operation, I believe that you would actually get better than that. Um, or I mean, slightly, at least slightly better than that because of the design of the fixture. And they haven't been installed. It's a, it's a new fixture. They, they, SACCO just came out with it. Like I said, I wasn't aware of it <laughs> before they you know, came with, uh, Helm came into, you know, with a bid with it. Um, but heat kills LEDs. That's, that's in, a, in a perfect world, LEDs would last forever if it wasn't for heat. So, heat. And I'm, I'm a huge fan. I've talked about it for years about <clears throat> dark, sky, dark sky compliant. And this works well. In consideration of our upstairs apartments yes. in our commercial district here, so that they don't have these bright lights shining right into their windows all night long. Yes, um, that's a great feature. And uh, I, my other, my question though is, is that you mentioned the distance between the poles of 30 to 40 feet. So this is achieving that increase in <laughs> foot candles that we're looking for, which provides the additional safety in our community. That's where this all started, really, was the safety and the concerns of being able to um, uh, feel comfortable in the evening down here. That is my understanding, yes. Yeah, good. I'm sorry. Elena? When you say they're destroyed by heat, do you mean heat from, it's 90 degrees out, or heat from? The fixture. The fixture itself, and, yeah. So both, uh, ambient oh. temperature and also the heat generated with the electrical, the, you know, uh, energy, you know, electrical converted to light by the LEDs. So that gives off heat as well. Um, it does, okay. And then you have it also compounded, the issues compounded by the, you know, the covers themselves. So the heat has to escape somewhere. Uh, it gets trapped in that cover. So by having better heat dissipation on the fixture itself, uh, you don't have the issue compounded by the fact that they're covered as well. So um, I hope not to be too premature, but I'm open to make a motion on this. We have one more thing that I want to go over, if you don't mind. Okay, go ahead. Um, the last option is um, a 30-year lease arrangement, which includes utilities. Um, right now, the DDA is paying $9,595 um, last fiscal year for the utilities and the lamp posts. Um, and the lease arrangement would either be $13,786 annually or $14,463 annually. Um, this sounds like a great deal, um, but our our investment um, of retrofitting all of the lights is a lower all lower overall investment across time than this 30-year lease arrangement is um, this is but this is a program that both Rochester and Oxford I believe are using so this is a viable option which is why I included it here it's just not what I'm recommending I think all three of these are good options, though. So, the DDA board um, should 
to make the decision that you think is the best one. Um, we originally started out, um, our budget for this project was $75,000. Um, the most expensive is $39,400. Um, so we are well within our budget, no matter which decision you decide to make. Uh, I would also like to I point out, I forgot to mention the, the light level readings I have for the SATCO demos are an average of 1.7 foot candles in the dead zones around the lights. But if you take and shine the, my light meter directly up at the lights, you get about three to four foot candles. That's so wild because they don't look as bright. I know. We were looking at them last night. <laughs> yeah. We were doing our, Hank and I were doing our own little gorilla practice. Testing. And it, I believe you were, you saw me take my original light level the one night yeah. when, we, when we did our first demo. Um, so you saw what I was using. I did, yeah. Mm -hmm. Did, oh. did we get a recommendation from the DPW out of curiosity? Um, they, their initial um, thought was that it should be this style so that it's easier to change out. Mm -hmm. um, the direct, the, we, um, the DPW cannot change out the light bulbs that are the direct um, right. wire. The, an electrician needs to do that. Um, however, if something happens to one of these lights, they can climb up there and screw it, you know, get a different light bulb. Well, so. SATCO is not a direct wire, correct? No, it is not. It's a screw. Right. It's a corn cob. Yes. Right. Yeah, so they're all, right. Are you asking um, which light they preferred? Because I didn't ask that question. Uh, just if they made a recommendation. <laughs> they're okay with the SATCO uh, product. And, they're the same. Uh, they're both screwed. Yeah. Yeah. That's why I'm curious. I, I didn't ask. It's up to us to it's, make the preference. <laughs> I didn't ask because the they're only, both screw in. They wanted screw in, so yeah. that's what I did. The only thing I would like to have done differently is in our packet, because mm -hmm. I would have liked to have a performa. I know you said that over the longer term it's cheaper, but I would have liked to have that performa. I'll trust that based upon my recommendation that I think we should go with your recommendation of the Helm Electric, but in the future I'd like to see the performa. One other thing I'd like to add to that I was actually thinking about on my way over here when I was looking at these is um, they are not, they're sealed but not totally sealed for the purposes of heat dissipation. If you look at them and come up and look later, you can see bugs do get in here. The SATCOs are sealed, so they wouldn't have that issue. Um, so you would have to not only maintain the, you know, the covers and cleaning the covers on an annual basis to maintain your brightness like I believe they already do, you'd also have to unscrew these and, and clean out the bugs as well. So it's a little more added maintenance over the other option. And that's not maintenance that we currently do. I have, um, I have the direct wired ones in my office and they've got a lot of bugs. Yeah. They're, yeah. <clears throat> Go ahead. I just have a quick question. So the current lights that we have, I understand they're getting dimmer over time. How long would they last if we did nothing? Just as a reference point, so do you think? As a reference point, you'd probably get another five years out of them because of the style, because of the direct wire, and there's better heat dissipation built into the fixtures themselves. Um, there's the, every light bar has its own heat sink. Um, the reason why you're getting delamination is just the, the way that those light bars were designed you know, five, six years ago. So it's an issue that we've <laughs> within the next five years would have to deal with. Well, they're yeah. going to continue to get dim more dim. Yes. Yeah. And I would, I would wager a guess that in the next year or two, you're going to start to see some fail. And, and if we already have, excuse me, if we already have um, residents who are in certain areas are not feeling safe walking at night, why would we delay our response if we've already been, it's been brought to our attention? attention right. And this proposal is for the entire DDA area, which is along M24 as well. M24, just, Meeks not Park. Not downtown. Yes, not So just it's going to be a great improvement, especially with downcast lighting. It's, I think it's going to add a lot of uh, historic um, considerations and feel there. Yeah. And the, the lights that are the, the, the direct wire uh, option that, that currently exists are the ones within the, the right in the village. The ones that have been retrofitted already are Meeks Park and M24. And then some, uh, I think Shadbolt in the parking lot, there's one over there, or a few over there. Um, those are the ones that are already the, the smaller screw-in type, and then the rest of them are that direct wire one that you currently have. So I'll Thank make you. a motion. I'll make a motion to do the, to uh, 
follow the director's recommendation to approve the contract with Home Electric for Lamp Post Retrofit with Dark Sky Compliant Bulbs. Not to exceed 39400 from 248-739-75005, pending legal counsel approval. Support. Roll call. Roll the question. Oh, okay. any uh, discussion which, or which, question? Which light are we doing? It's um, that is the dark sky compliant. That's what Helm Electric is offering. It's the one that doesn't look as bright, but it's brighter. So it's yeah, the one, one at the, 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 it's, the yeah, it's, it's yours, right? It's the one I like. <laughs> <laughs> we didn't it, talk about this ahead of time. I, I just liked it because I think the ones on the, I'm surprised to see that they test brighter. I believe you, but um, the other ones are so bright. Mm -hmm. It just, it almost hurts your eyes. And if at the whole village is that, I think it's going to look like a, um, I tease Independence Township all the time, but if you drive down the Sashabaw corridor um, off 75, it looks like a runway. It looks like an airport runway. It's it's too bright. And I like I like that. I, I initially didn't like it because it felt old, but it feels like it fits the character of downtown better. Agreed. And especially where you have the people that have the string lights, they're the same color. They're not the, the, the bright white is almost too white. So. I, 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 I agree with Ken on this one. So that's the light. That's if, what he, uh, that's the motion he made. If I can add one more thing, the lights that are on the Luckies and that's about chocolate side, those are 5,000 Kelvin color temperature. The lights that were in the bid are 3,000 Kelvin color temperature. So um, they're not going to be as, you know, as bright as ever. Yeah, fourth. Will they still be the bright white color? They'll still be the white color, but just okay. not as blinding as they are now. So I, I just want to make sure everyone understands. Could you, say that, could you say that one more time, please? Yes. The lights that are on the Nuts About Chocolate and Lucky side of the crosswalk are 5,000 Kelvin color And that's the ones that's, that we're currently looking at when we're checking out down there, correct? Yeah, but the, that's not the motion. The motion is the ones yeah. across the street. Yes. On correct, the street. but I just want to yes. make sure. Yeah. I want and, to make sure. But what I, all, all I was pointing out is that the lights that were in the bids are 4,000 color to Kelvin color temperature. So they're not going to be as blinding. They're going to be more of a soft white. So I just want to make sure, like I said, impartial third party, I want to make sure you understand all the pros and cons. Um, they're not going to be as, you know, that, that they're going to be brighter, right? I mean, just because of the nature of the style of the bulb, and they're going to be uh, 4,000 Kelvin versus 2,700 Kelvin. Um, they're still going to be bright when you look at them, and it still could look like an, an, an airplane or an, uh, an airfield, uh, to your comment. But... Um, I feel that based on my experience in communities um, that DTE operates in, you would get less complaints about brightness with the SATCO fixtures than you would with this option. I, maybe they'll be white, but they won't be ultra white. Exactly. Yeah. Um, yeah, what, um, I, I see there's a five-year warranty on these. Um, how long do these bulbs last and how much do they cost individually? Uh, they're rated for 50,000 hours. I got to do math okay. real quick. Can you give me that in yeah. days? Or <laughs> Yes, I can. Thank you. So 12 hours a day, 365 a year. Okay. I wasn't sure what the calculation would be, how many hours a day they're on. Or So they technically would last you 11.4 years, but okay. they're only warranted for five. And the reason being is that's when you start to see fallout. Right. And how much do they cost individually? Individually, without contract or markup, these bulbs cost anywhere between 65 to $7 a piece. The SATCOs cost anywhere between 100 and 120 a piece. Okay. $100, $120 a piece to replace. Yeah. So, it, this, yeah, this, uh, the corn cob option, 65 to $70 to replace. The, the SATCO, the, the, the warm light, the dark, dark sky compliant, 100 to $120 a piece. Okay. And then they'll last about 12000 Wait, 12,000 hours? Uh, 50,000 hours, 11.4 no. years. I'm curious what the actual warranty is covering. Is it if the light just doesn't work anymore? Yes. Or, okay. So the, Not if it's fading or starting, start, start, starting to fade in year four? So when we were talking um, to some of the contractors, we asked who would handle a warranty claim. They would actually come out and handle it. What they look at is was it caused by a brownout or was it truly a failure of the bulb? Anything caused by a brownout, they usually give you a okay and we'll give you a freebie. If it happens again, you're not going to get it. But if it's truly a manufacturer's defect, they cover that up to five years. Okay. Up to five years? Yep. Yes. Yeah. Okay. 
I, I know um, you might want to offer public comment. I know Ms. Can't, Ms. Beatty had a comment at the beginning about the cost and things. I, I think some of that was covered. One of the things just I wanted to note is that this is a priority of the DDA. We did discuss it and budget for it, knowing that we were looking at potentially doing this project this year. So this is something that we have planned to do based on business and resident feedback. And, the, and what, we're, what you've kind of outlined is that the, while they still work for now, we're starting to see the drop off and getting some complaints of darkness. Do you know which one Lloyd liked? That one. Mm -hmm. He likes the bright white. Yeah, you're welcome for public comment. So I guess my only concern is it's not really needed, needed, needed. I know it might be in your budget right now, but it, according to the homework that I've been doing, you're still paying off your streetscape project from 2011. So technically, we're still paying for the lights we have, correct? No? Okay. Maybe that's another loan. But right. I just, I don't feel that it's needed right at the moment. But that's, um, and it seems like it goes backwards a little bit in technology. I mean, I get the, the maintenance factor that, you know, our, our guys can just change the light bulbs and more, it's easier. Um, it just doesn't seem like it's the right time. So um, that's just my two cents. Agreed, and I, I can comment on that if you would like. Please. Um, so you're correct. Um, it is a little bit backwards, right? The, the direct wired post top retrofits are the, the best in class, if you will. Um, we did get a quote on that. Um, they range anywhere from $90,000 to $120,000. Um, being that you are and this speaks to the timeline of is it right time to do it or not. Um, you know, being that you're only halfway through the usable life of these bulbs, um, I could understand that. But um, the landscape of LED is changing so much that if you put in a hundred thousand know, dollar post top retrofit project, those lights would be obsolete in two years. So the kind of the thought process, if you wanted to do it today, go with something like this that isn't outrageously expensive um, to where if something latest and greatest came out in the next five years that you wanted to do a, a, a better technology that you see in post top retrofit that cost more, um, maybe that makes, you know, would yeah, make sense. Yeah, you can just screw them in. Right. Right? Well, these ones you could. Uh, what, uh, what you were referring to going backwards in technology, the direct wire, you would, if you went to a, uh, uh, um, something that was direct wire that was even brighter that saved more energy but was more efficient because of that direct wire connection. Um, that's what would cost, if you were to do that today, it would cost you anywhere between ninety and one hundred twenty thousand dollars right. for your so hundred and fifty. It's not backwards because our DPW can change these. Right now, we have to hire an electrician to sure. come change them. The fact that we're only halfway through the ball blank is a little bit immaterial to me because they're already failing. They're delaminating and we're losing lumens. We've had the public ask us to improve the lighting, especially during the winter time when they're trying to walk where there's a little bit of slippery uh, conditions and so on and so forth, and they don't feel safe with some of our efforts to move some of the outlying parking lots, you know, use out that way. Mm -hmm. There's been complaints about that. We've had businesses come to us and say, hey, we'd like to see better lighting downtown. I, I don't know why it's not a good timing right now. And Molly, you shook your head there for a moment. Have, are we still paying for those street lights? I believe that. No, we're not. We are not. Um, we are, what we're paying off right now is the um, new parking lot and um, making Front Street a two way road. Again, that's the project that we are currently paying off. Right. That funding has been done. Thank you. And that's why when we wrote the spec, um, and that's why I can recommend this type of light or similar in, in spec, because of you know you're only halfway through the usable life, you don't want to spend ninety to one hundred twenty thousand dollars when they might be obsolete in two years because the landscape of LEDs is changing on a yearly basis. So you don't know what's going to be out there in five years. You might be able, they might come down in price and might be able to cut your energy bills in half. It doesn't exist now, doesn't mean it won't later. So 
That's why I say if you want to do something now because of the complaints you're getting, that's why we, I made the recommendation to go with this style um, because of cost. Well, our first priority is safety. And we want to ensure that our sidewalks and our streets are safe for our residents, for our customers, for our property owners, for our business owners. So we have listened. It was one of the priorities, top priorities, that was voted on by the community. So thank you very much. We appreciate your presentation. We ready for? Roll call. Roll call. Laurent? Yes. Medina? Yes. Shell? Yes. Van Portfleet? Yes. Barnett? Yes. Burgess? Yes. Campbell? Yes. Motion carries 7 0. Thank you. Um, I want to thank Lloyd Co. Um, and Joe Mansour and Linda Crane, um, who all were very involved in this process. Um, Lloyd has been spending a lot of time on the streets um, looking at the lights and talking to people <laughs> about the lights and um, and he wanted to make sure that um, that I shared his observation that the shapes of our trees are also inhibiting the light um, and I pointed out that we have brand new trees that are a different shape um, so they are not doing the same thing, but um, we, the trees are also causing some of the shadows at night at dark, and that's, um, that was an observation that Lloyd wanted to make sure I shared with you. And I, and I thank you very much for all of his work. Thank you. Moving on to- Agreed, yeah. Okay, moving on to item number four, DDA, VLO, Joint Committee, page 129. All right. Um, the DDA and the village have um, formed a committee. We've met twice. Um, we're meeting again October 21st. Um, the lawyers um, will be involved in, with that meeting. Um, the, on pack, starting on packet 130, um, this is the information um, that was provided um, to the committee. Um, we also reviewed the um, LDFA uh, reports from the township, um, talking which which are the base reports showing um, how our funds are uh, redistributed to us from the other taxing jurisdictions. So um, that's what was used um, for all of these numbers. You're just looking to see who will be able to attend the meeting at the. On yeah, on the 21st, it's Friday at 1 o'clock, October 21st, um, and our, our uh, appointed people are Chairperson Burgess, Vice Chair Shell, and Secretary, uh, he's not the Secretary. Okay, so it would be Chairperson Burgess, Treasurer Shell, and Vice Chair Caruso. Um, those are the ones who are assigned to, who were appointed originally. I plan to be there. I will be there. Okay. I just move, I move to receive and file. Thank you. Okay. Support. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. Moving on to number nine, reports, resolutions, and recommendations. Executive Director. All right. All right. It's been a very busy month. Um, and I'm talking about October. <laughs> um, we had a, a meeting um, regarding the moment in time historic signs. As you know, those are around town. Um, they're at Fork and Pint, Hanson's, um, the Verwood, and 313. Um, we have, uh, we just looked over Greens Park and the train station signs. On Greens Park, we're going to have five foot by three foot signs on the buildings. One is about the boats of Lake Orion, and the second one is about the amusement park. They're gonna be huge, I, I'm so excited about these. And the third one is trains of Lake Orion, and this will be a freestanding sign, three feet by 30, um, right outside of um, kind of uh, down Flint Street a little bit from our um, gateway sign that says Village of Lake Orion established 
when we were established. <laughs> so, um, and that's, that's in line with where the, the train actually came through Lake Orion. So those are, um, those are the ones that are coming up. Um, the Historic Society is looking at um, helping out uh, with signs at the Eamon Center and also at the Lakeshore sites. And the committee discussed um, creating memos of understanding with those um, property owners to make sure that we have um, similar branding and that the Historic Society can approve the what's written and, um, and so that we have um, consistency throughout our, our sign program. Um, on page 28 in your packet is a calendar. Um, note that our next meeting, um, the November meeting, is going to be a week later um, than normal, and that's due to the elections. You also see um, that I'm requesting that we go to the October 24th um, Village Council meeting because we are requesting that they issue bonds. Um, we have a busy, we're just busy in October. The last half of October is very busy. <laughs> um, and I want to start with Thursday. Uh, we need a board member who can present a downtown dollar on behalf of the DDA board for Treva Corp ribbon cutting um, this Thursday at 4.30 and it'll be at 214 South Broadway. Yeah, that sounds easy. <laughs> okay. Um, thank you. Thank you. We have a uh, stakeholder meeting um, will be on October 18th at 8.30. Um, the location is still to be determined. On Wednesday the 19th, it's the Halloween extravaganza from 5 until 7 in the Children's Park area. If you are able to um, help us um, set up, please contact Susie. Um, if you plan to have a table, please let Susie know uh, right away. We have um, space for people who just want a table and then also for um, people who want a tent or some other extra, they need extra space. We're, we're making plans and we welcome everybody. Um, Saturday, October 22nd is a Stronger Together Witches Night. And this Witches Night is, has been um, held in uh, Oxford for a number of years and it is impressively popular. And it will be from five until nine. Um, Susie and I need some help setting up at four o'clock on Saturday the 22nd. And we could use um, two to three helpers from five until seven, and then someone who can help us clean up um, starting at seven. Um, we are planning to pass out bags for Witches Night. Um, and we're going to set up near the trolley stop uh, in front of the Burwood, as we did last time. Uh, we had a luau night, ladies luau night, and that's where we were, and it was lovely to see everybody coming off the trolley and grabbing their stuff and dispersing all over downtown. Um, it, warlocks are welcome. I am looking forward to seeing all the witches and the warlocks in, in our downtown. Um, we've got a, one of our stores is planning to have a palm reader. Um, we are looking forward to seeing what happens here, and, and I want to thank Oxford for including us. Um, and then we have the 24th. The 24th is the bond issue request at Village Council. Um, the Village Council meeting is at 7.30. We really need their support. We, um, this is a project that is definitely a community-wide project, and it definitely cannot get this done without um, Village Council support. So please come um, and let them know how important this is um, to the DDA board. And then on Tuesday, <laughs> the 25th, uh, we have a business summit in downtown tour. Um, that'll start at 8.30 and it goes until 11. Um, we will start at Shaded Bloom and 20 Front Street. Um, and this is, uh, this is our business's opportunity to talk to elected officials and <coughs> political candidates about, what, uh, about the issues that are important to their businesses. So we are definitely asking our businesses to come. Um, the invitations to the candidates and the elected officials included questions. We, we've given them their homework. So they've got four questions um, that we um, want them to be ready to answer um, during the forum. 
and they are business related. Um, and I want to thank the organization committee, um, particularly Elena um, of our board for helping us um, get this arranged. And I'm looking forward to, um, to having our businesses have a voice. Then on Thursday, <laughs> the 27th, that's our design charrette. As um, Scott Reynolds um, mentioned, it's from five until seven. Um, and that gets us through the end of the month. Um, busy, busy, busy. I want to thank Bill Kokinos for coming to answer the phones for the DDA office. Um, we are short uh, one employee. Um, and I am, I am interviewing, but I'm, I want you to know that I've had two qualified candidates um, withdraw their interest, um, noting that our pay is too low. Um, I think that uh, we probably need to think about um, raising our hourly rate for that position to $20 an hour so that I'm not getting turned down flat out just because of the hourly rate. And finally, I need help um, passing out uh, the Business Summit invitation to the businesses, and I also have Halloween posters to pass out. Um, Oh, and lastly, I gave you this um, Fenton Art Trail. Um, Fenton has art all over the place. This is, I, I, this is a lot of art. One, two, three, four pages of art. They said that they um, actually rent some of their sculptures, and it changes out every year. So they rent a sculpture, and it's placed, and then next year it's a different one, and they do have some that are owned. Um, I like that idea. Um, we, have, we have our historic signs and we have public art, so we could do something similar to this. Um, and I, I appreciate being able to go talk to Fenton. That is everything. Thank you. And we do not have a village manager report tonight. Okay, moving on to call to the public. Anyone want to speak? Sure. Uh, totally unrelated <laughs> to the lights. Um, so... There's been uh, a lot of graffiti. I don't know if anyone's noticed it or it's been called anyone's attention yet, but in the children's park, um, the brand new playground um, by the public works garage, that park over there by the ball field, someone is graffitiing with spray paint on the, the library stands, the slides, uh, anything they can, like on the window of the small children's um, playground in the children's park. Um, I don't know if anyone said anything about it or anyone knows about it. That's wanted to bring it to your attention. Uh, it's been it's been recent. It looks like it's getting worse. I go on walks with my wife, and my two year old, all the time, and yeah, it's there. Thank you for bringing that to our attention. Thanks. Moving on to item number eleven: board comments and training feedback. Mr. Van Portfleet. Um, I a lot of good stuff tonight. <clears throat> And what comes to mind is maybe my closing comments is between the lumberyard development, safety improvements here in the community, uh, the joint DDA, Village of Lake Orion Joint Committee, this is um, a time for everybody to work together. This is a time for the community to really look forward to what this future is going to be because we have the opportunity and I hope that we seize it in all respects that's it for me okay. Lena? um i just want to thank um aka again but also for arranging our visit today to fenton that was um very helpful to see what another community has done um to revitalize their community um yet um, ensure that the development is fitting within the vision of what the community wanted. Um, and I thought that was really encouraging. And I'm really excited about uh, the Lumberyard project because that is our opportunity to listen to the community and provide what is needed um, and have control over that, uh, what gets developed there. So. Exciting stuff. All right. Nothing this time. You know, it's uh, been a very interesting week. Um, yes, already, and it's only Tuesday. Um, 
yesterday the council listened to some proposals for the DDA and, uh, and, it'll, and uh, to, to basically do away with the DDA. Um, luckily, those proposals didn't go through. I think we have a strong DDA that is pushing hard to make this community the best they could be. And I would suggest that everybody take a look at the candidates that are coming up and, and see who's supporting who. Thank you. No comment. Believe it or not, I have a few. Um, I'm here as a volunteer. I've served on this board for 10 years as a volunteer. I love this board. I've stirred the pot. I have hopefully been collaborative. Um, and over the, the last year has been super interesting. We have been absolutely under attack. And it's been the weirdest thing. We've lost people, downtown business owners, that have volunteered their time because they didn't want to deal with the attacks. It's really sad. I agree with you, Ken. I think it's a time to come together. We don't meet on our normal meeting day because we have an election. It might be the most important election in the villages in recent history in the village. There are people that want to do away with the DDA. We have a sitting village council member last night that proposed a, a new tax, raising taxes on the businesses to fund the DDA, if his proposal to eliminate the DDA was successful. If you don't believe me, watch the, watch the comments. He's, he proposed a two mil tax on the businesses in the district. Just so we're clear, if the DDA goes away, not one resident saves one penny. No one's taxes go down one penny. So it's, you know, we have to work on facts. There's a group of people that are working on opinions. Facts never change. And I'm proud of this group that have worked really hard over the last few months to make sure that we're always presenting facts. People might not like the DDA for whatever reason. What's really been interesting to me to see is a lot of the people that signed the petition, two of them, three of them last night spoke and said they wish they would have, they, they want to take their name I, off. I talked to two more today. Our facts don't change. I talked to four. And I think that this campaign of misinformation and opinions has been really damaging to our downtown. If you don't think the business community will rally to support the DDA, you have no idea. And that's to any candidate that's running right now. And the fact that several of them are afraid to speak their opinion and support because they've been threatened by people going out there saying if they give their comments, they're gonna pay, they're gonna not get business, that's really sad to me. Um, I think because we've been under the microscope, it's been a really good opportunity for us. Our peers, we have lots of, and, and, and we, I, I love this quote, in education it's called plagiarism, in the public sector it's called best practices. We're not competing really against Auburn Hills and Rochester and Oxford because our residents live here, we're, you know, yes, in a way we are, but. We take the best ideas in government. For example, this bond financing. We're doing the same thing that works for everyone else. That's the cheapest way to do it. Um, that's called the best practice. And because we've been under the microscope, we've had people from all over the state saying, why are you guys being attacked? We want to help. You guys are winning awards regionally, nationally. Um, our, and some of the things we've been able to do that we never really thought we had to do in defending ourselves is we found out that we give back more money than any other DDA in Oakland County to our village. We, our property rates, I did this study myself, have raised between 12 and 15% higher trajectory than downtown Auburn Hills and downtown Rochester over a five year period. So our residents are seeing the return on investment. We're effective. And what I've said over and over and over is you never get more with less. I hope, I agree with you, Hank, a lot of us were here last night. I hope that was a period at the end of this really long sentence that's been really tiring for some of us last night, when there was a motion, no support, to have a special election to potentially eliminate the DDA. I think we've proven our worth, uh, and the lighting's a perfect example. If we didn't have a DDA, I would venture to guess, in the next year or two, we're gonna continue to get complaints about dimming lights, some will flicker, and because we lose almost a half million dollars a year in revenue, and no offense to the village, they have other priorities, my venture to guess that our lighting game would be weak. 
And I think that's really important. We are proactive. And there's one thing that all these strong downtowns across our state have in common. They all have a TIF. They have a Corridor Improvement Authority, a DDA, a CIA. They don't eliminate them. It's a great tool. So I'm really grateful for the work that Molly, that our staff has done. And I don't think people realize the extreme pressure that they've been under over the last few months where their jobs are literally in jeopardy, yet they're still banging it out every day. We're grateful for our staff, our, our, our leaders here, our chair, who have put in dozens and dozens and dozens of extra hours on their own time to fight to defend the work we do. And I think if you look at our facts, they haven't changed. The other side has. There's a woman that's running that's a spouse of a sitting member that wants to eliminate the DDA. People need to understand that. That would be devastating for our village. These are my comments, and I'm allowed to make them. I, need, we, I think it's our job to educate people. The people that don't stand for our strong downtown do not deserve your vote. Thank you. I just want to say that uh, the village of Lake Orion is a very special place to live. And we have a tremendous opportunity in front of us to come together as a community and to unite as a community. And my hope is that as we have said, look at us through the lens of transparency and look at all of the many projects that have been completed through the DDA. And in doing so, you're going to see the results will be that this community has grown, it has flourished during the pandemic, many businesses were saved because of the efforts. And um, the other thing that nobody has mentioned, and I'm just gonna briefly touch on it, if the DDA were to be eliminated, several of the restaurants that you see in town potentially could no longer be here. Think hard, think very clear about how you vote, because your vote matters. And I believe this community is worth us standing together and fighting for her. Our next regular meeting is gonna be November 15th, 2022, and at this time we have a motion for adjournment. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. Good night, everyone. Ooh.